Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. The space age has given us a new view of our planet. We've probed the distant reaches of the cosmos and explored other worlds, but the most impressive world encountered thus far is our Mother Earth. A friendly atmosphere, plentiful water, and home to a remarkable realm of life, the forest. One of the grandest forest regions on Earth stretches across the 13 states of the southern U.S. While other worlds may tell us of the history of the universe, the southern forest is key to much of the history of the south, to the region's rich heritage of land and people. You see the white looking bark on this tree? Yes, sir. This is a white oak. People have long yes, been an active participant the in the southern forest community. The forest has shaped our lives in many ways, and in turn, we have shaped the forest. Every time we come out here, it's an adventure. We might find an old log full of beetles in, in one place, a new seedling sprouting in another place. There's always something interesting going on with the wildlife. You know, the average American doesn't realize the beauty and the diversity that we find in our forests. It's a thing of wonderment to me, something that you have to experience firsthand. It's something that gives you a tremendous affinity for, for all of nature in terms of the things that were placed here for us to enjoy and to use to benefit mankind. Well, the forest represents a type of freedom. We can go out into the forest and appreciate nature. We have the ability to see what's around us. And we also have the ability to imagine how things were long before man conquered this land. The southern forest is essential to the quality of life, to the way of life that is such a valuable part of southern culture. Despite the technological advances of the modern age, we still depend on our forest resources for the economic and the environmental benefits that make our lives possible. The Southern Forest is among the most diverse and productive forest regions in the world. And some experts would say the crown jewel of this forested realm is our state of Alabama. I'm Doug Phillips. Many of our previous programs have dealt with the natural qualities of the forest. In this program, we're going to take a journey back across time for a special story about the historical role of people in the changing status of our forest resources. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has maintained its native natural wonders, a place of bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the wild wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama, and welcome to an Alabama forest. As any good woodsman can attest, to get a better fix on where we're headed in the future, sometimes it helps to know where we've been in the past. This is a story about the history of our forest, told with the assistance of those who know the forest best, from landowners and their families who've worked the forest for generations, to historians who've spent their careers studying it. The forest that we see, have here today came in over the last 18 to 20,000 years since the peak of the last ice age, the Wisconsin Ice Age. Of course, this has seen them migrate across our landscape and adapt to the various ecological conditions that prevailed, such that, that the species we see out here now are those that are uniquely adapted to the conditions, climatic soil, other conditions that are unique to the southeastern forests. Of the many hundreds of tree species of North America, more than half are found in the southern forest. It is also home to many thousands of species of other plants and animals. 
And from the beginning, our forests have been home for another creature. The first humans in the southern forest were prehistoric hunters and gatherers, small bands who migrated throughout the region, living off the natural bounty of the woods. Over the centuries, the nomadic bands became town dwellers and farmers, and their impact on the southern forest grew. This is Moundville, Alabama, site of one of the largest prehistoric Indian towns in the southeast. This plaza area here has been kept open and cleared much the way it was when the Indians established here almost a thousand years ago. At the town's zenith, archaeologists estimate that much of the area for miles around was cleared for farmland to support this community. These Indians had become very adept at harvesting and managing the southern forest. From wood, they made their homes and their canoes, their tools, and the walls around their villages. And to clear all those thousands of acres of farmland, they used more than stone axes like this. They used fire. Their widespread use of fire was for a number of reasons. Certainly, they wanted to keep the forest open to enable grasses to grow and in turn support the animals that they fed upon. But in addition to this, they needed an open environment for, so they could see their enemies coming, to encourage blackberries, blueberries, these kinds of food plants. And another thing often overlooked is that they were primarily agriculturalists, farmers, at the time the Europeans found them. And to open up bottomlands along streams for farming, the only available tool they had was fire. With the arrival of the Europeans, the long period of prehistory came to an end. And so did the reign of Indian cultures. The Europeans had introduced smallpox, influenza, and other diseases for which the Native American had no immunity. In short order, their population was decimated. With Native culture disrupted, the practice of clearing and burning diminished. Most of the lands previously left open soon filled with new forest growth. In less than 100 years, the southern region had regenerated a new forest. And this was the forest encountered by the colonists, and later the settlers, who spread throughout the region, lured by the appeal of such a rich wilderness. William Bartram, a botanist, traveled in this area shortly after the Revolutionary War, about 1770. He actually gave us the first historical record of conditions of the landscape at that time, and what he described was predominantly a high forest in contrast to the mosaic of savanna prairie land and high forest described earlier. The forest that greeted the settlers is often thought of as a virgin forest, though it had already been shaped and reshaped many times by the combined actions of nature and people over thousands of years. But from around the time of William Bartram to the present, the history of the southern forest can be viewed as a story of discovery, depletion, and recovery. After the late 1700s, there was the emergence of a new nation. The land resources, the timber supplies of the North were largely used up by the population centers and cities that had developed in that area, and a new frontier was needed. That new frontier was the West and the South. Land grants to soldiers of the Revolutionary War, immigration, general population pressure was requiring that people move out of these centers and find new resources that would serve the growth of the nation. Waves of settlers, filled with a young spirit of self-reliance, headed into the southern region to find a vast forest of untamed abundance. Huge stands of hardwoods, oaks, hickories, and chestnuts dominated the rugged Appalachian and Piedmont highlands. Large tracts of pines stretched across the coastal plains. And throughout the region were thousands of miles of great river bottom forests and vast stands of cypress and the settlers were quick to take advantage of this bounty. Almost wherever a dam could produce a head of water, primitive sawmills cut boards, timbers, and stave planks. Some products were for export to the timber-starved ports of England and the North. Other products would supply the needs of a growing southern economy that was shifting increasingly from forest to farming. Meanwhile, People were still dependent on wood for practically every need. Tools, building materials, fuel. And with all those farms, there were a lot of fences, about three million miles worth, 
enough to circle the world 120 times. And of course, you have to replace rotting rails at a rate of about 64,000 miles of railing per year. Though there was great demand for wood during this settlement period, soon to follow was a period of even greater impact to the southern forest. During the mid and latter part of the 1800s, America went through the turmoil of the Civil War, and shortly after this, there was very rapid industrial expansion. The real hallmark of this industrial expansion was the pushing of railroads back into some of the remote, more remote parts of the south and even toward the west. This made the resources of these regions available for the growth of the nation that had previously been served by timber supplies of the north. Now these new sources of raw material were available for the growth of the cities of the eastern seaboard. The rail expansion itself accounted for nearly 25% of America's total wood consumption. Except for the steel engines and rails, railroads were almost totally made of wood. The cross ties, the cars, the bridges, the stations. Each mile of track required nearly five miles of cross ties, which were replaced every five to seven years. By the end of the century, almost 20 million acres of forest had been consumed for railroad ties alone. Near the turn of the century, it became apparent that much of the Northeast and Lake States forests, their white pines, for example, would soon be exhausted. At the time, builders didn't like the southern yellow pine because of its high resin content. But a shortage of white pine caused most to reassess. When they found the southern product to be lightweight, easily handled, and durable, the southern forests were invaded. The timber industry moved south. You logged with railroads. You had to build railroads, and you had to take them up afterwards. When you went in a place, you got it all. And by and large, they cut it, uh, abandoned it, either turned the land back to the county or tried to sell it to somebody f to farm and went to find another track of land to cut somewhere and do the same thing. Large tracts of timber were bought for as little as $1.25 per acre. When enough acreage was acquired, a mill was built, and if it wasn't located near an established town, a town was built, a company town complete with houses, stores, offices, schools, and churches. And most of this was a family operation. You had uh, a whole families that might live in a, in a camp, a railroad supplied camp, uh, 15 or 20 miles. From, from the sawmill. There were several railroads that came into this town. This lake uh, had several hotels on it. People would come from miles around to enjoy this particular area. Around 1910 or something like that, the Jackson Lumber Company actually had the largest sawmill in the world located here in Lockhart. Uh, there were thousands of people employed at it, and um, they cut some of the finest longleaf pine timber that there was in the United States uh, here. As the nation's appetite for wood grew, timber companies moved rapidly through the south. What remained of the southern forest was fast disappearing. In 1909, 21.2 billion board feet of lumber were cut. The year 1909 is recorded as the largest consumption, largest production and consumption of lumber uh, in, our whole, uh, in our whole country's history. My daddy said it was a sight. Old pictures show how you could look from a ridge top clear across half the county. About the only thing left standing was the high stumps. Back then, a tree wasn't worth enough to cause a man to suffer bending all the way over just to get this bottom few feet. It was called the time of cut out and get out. By the 1920s, the great southern forest was in severe decline. In parts of several southern states, forest cover had fallen to as low as 20%. Lumber companies sold the cutover land quickly or just abandoned it to avoid taxes. The land was desolate. With no plant cover, there was massive erosion. Streams silted over. Plants and some animals were lost forever. If today's standards were applied then, deer and turkey would have been endangered species. Government officials declared much of the South a wasteland. And so by the 1920s, the great southern forest that had been newly discovered by settlers of a century earlier was now in a state of widespread depletion. This was a period of some of the worst environmental ruin in southern history. 
Some would argue it was due to the economic necessity of the times, but it was also due largely to ignorance. Whatever the cause, one thing was widely agreed. The situation was bad, and it was time for corrective action. Out of all of this grew a new movement around the turn of the century with key players such as Teddy Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold, Gifford Pinchot, all of which finally resulted in the birth of a new movement of conservation and finally the birth of the profession of forestry around the turn of the century. On the advice of professional foresters, the government took a lead role by setting aside forest reserves, initially to recover and protect streams and watersheds, and later also to assure a renewable supply of timber. In 1920, the U.S. added to its original forest reserves by establishing a system of national forests. The hardy spirit of those who had settled the South was active as well. Many Southern landowners were working hard to keep their farms and communities alive, to keep their families on the land too. New government programs like the Tennessee Valley Authority, the U.S. Soil Conservation Service, and state forestry agencies worked cooperatively to assist landowners whenever possible. There was an all-out push to encourage better land management and reforestation. The Civilian Conservation Corps is a good example. The CCC put thousands of unemployed men and women to work building roads, fire breaks, and erosion controls, and planting trees, millions and millions of trees. Eventually, new state agencies worked with landowners in restocking wildlife, controlling fire, and developing conservation education programs. People from all walks were getting involved, helping restore the forest, and helping promote a new awareness for the land. Now, I was there, so I know we can talk about how the forest has come back, but the big thing that happened earlier this century was the conservation movement. It led to a whole new perspective across this nation. In the years following World War II, many people were moving to industrial jobs in the growing urban areas. Vacated farmlands were free to regenerate or to be planted into productive forests. The period of the recovering southern forests now began to pick up speed. Industrial efficiency improved markets for pulpwood and saw timber. Landowners became ever more conscious that good forest management means better forest productivity. Across the south, and particularly in Alabama, we see a forest that's much more robust than it was 70 or 80 years ago, and more diverse. Uh, they, this story is good over a long period of time. Today, timber is the South's cash crop. And the economic value of the forest benefits our society in many ways, providing thousands of products that meet important needs in practically every aspect of daily life. But the forest also remains a resource of many additional values for those closest to the land. The deer have made a great comeback, and the wildlife do well, and, and, they, and they thrive in, in, when, when the forest is being managed. We're also proud of this land. We're proud of the heritage that it represents. We're proud of the ability to be able to allow our children to see and benefit from nature, whereas in the city, we don't have, we don't have the ability to do that. This is a farm that has seen cotton and corn and soybeans and cattle and now predominantly timber. And it is a, an evolving process whereby we are trying to improve the condition of our forest. The history of Alabama's forest is similar to that for much of the South. Previous periods of forest depletion have been followed by a new emphasis on improved forest management and conservation. Through the combined efforts of government, industry, and landowners, productive forests have been reestablished across the region, promoting such environmental benefits as the recovery of many wildlife populations. And while modern methods of forest management are not free of environmental controversy, Alabama and other southern states today contain forest lands that are substantially restored from earlier times. And as we look back over the history of the changing southern forest, it's time to consider what may lie ahead for our forest resources.
the force have come back. Uh, it's been a combination of a number of things. The economics, uh, uh, the conservation movement, if you will, heightened awareness among landowners of what they have out there and what it's worth. Um, yes, it, it, it looks good, but, but we should be careful, and we should be extremely careful about how we use the word recovery. Um, we don't know everything about what's going on out there in these systems we're working with. It looks recovered, it acts recovered, but is it indeed recovered? And what will things be like out there 250 years from now? Will it be just as productive and sustainable as it seems to be right now? Uh, for example, in, in soils, uh, what, what are the long-term, very long-term impacts of what we're doing on soils? Those are things we need to be aware of. Those are things we know a lot about right now, but we don't know everything about, and we should be vigorously trying to find out. As we continue to depend on the forests for so many of our needs, we must continue to monitor our impact on soils, on habitat, and on wildlife. At times, some of these issues may divide us. The forest products community on one side, the environmental community on the other. But there's a long-term issue about which both sides agree. Our Mother Earth is filling with people as never before. Our society is changing from rural to urban. Making room for this change means continued conversion and loss of forest land. If you look at demographics in the southeast, uh, north central Alabama, for example, uh, across the state line of Georgia, there's no place in the United States that's developing any faster than those. And so we're losing a lot of forest land. The real tragedy in that is that, that children in particular lose any contact, you know, with the natural heritage. You know, they think about things in an urban setting. Many children have never been, never walked in the woods or, you know, camped out at night or gone hunting or fishing and that sort of thing. And the farther we get away from that, the greater the risk is that we lose sight of the value of the, uh, of our natural heritage and the forests and streams and things that we have. As history reveals, the status of our forest lands is a function of society's changing relationship to the land. The future of the forest will depend upon how well we promote appreciation and closeness to our forest heritage. In Alabama, the good news is such a caring spirit can be found among local leaders and landowners alike. The history and heritage of this area is significant and it is important. We decided to try to make an environmental facility something that was historical and educational park also. So we tried to plant different varieties out here so the schools could use it to come out and visit and identify different native plants and shrubs and trees that are here. We've got magnolias, dogwoods, redbuds, cypress, oaks and maple and we really tried to emphasize on the longleaf yellow pine because that's why we're here. Whatever the future, I think we need to ensure that families are able to keep owning and living on the land. I don't want this closeness this heritage to someday be only a faded memory in the minds of my children or my grandchildren. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but it seems what's at stake here is a way of life built on some basic values, hard work, family, daily contact with the land, and thus a personal respect for life, for people and nature. The forest is a realm like no other, a natural community that serves to maintain soil, water, wildlife, and people, a vital system of the Earth's unique biosphere of life. The southern forest, one of the greatest forest regions on Earth, has served like a gigantic stage on which has played the drama of southern history. It has welcomed the surge of human civilization it has endured the changes brought by the human struggle for existence. It has given generously, exhaustively, to supply our every need. In this century, a new sense of stewardship has grown for our forests, for the intangible as well as the tangible benefits that a healthy forest provides. And today, we must be ever mindful that the rapidly changing modern world remains ultimately dependent on resources from the natural world.
This program is supported by grants from the Solon and Martha Dixon Foundation, the Alabama Wildlife Federation, working for wildlife since 1935, Legacy, partners in environmental education, and the Robert G. Whaley Charitable Trust.